So uh, in this chapter, we're going to actually get to, uh, get to the conclusion of Paul's uh, first missionary journey. Again, it's he and Barnabas that have gone out uh, and been sent out. Kind of just in review, I've got a little slide for the, uh, the map that kind of, uh, uh, again, they start up there in Antioch, top right-hand corner, uh, Lebanon today. Uh, go down to uh, si- Island of Cyprus, uh, Salamis, and they 90 miles across the island, Paphos, where they... Uh, uh, lead uh, Sergius Paulus, the uh, Roman procurator for the area to the Lord. Uh, four, they go over and hit uh, uh, Perga, or the Cliffs of Despair. And uh, uh, John Mark, that's five, he leaves, uh, heads back home again. The Cliffs of Despair were too much for him. Uh, last week, uh, we, were, we had them in Antioch, and this week we're going to get them to Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, and then they're going to reverse the process and get all the way back uh, 1,100 miles, uh, it took them a year, and uh, we're looking at uh, uh, Paul's, how uh, resolute he was and, and determined he was, and of course it took a lot of determination when we'll read about some of the ways that uh, people responded to the gro- gospel, uh, and in fact Paul being taken outside Lystra and being stoned, uh, and some believing that, uh, uh, that he was dead, and then raised up from the dead, other believes that he just was close to death, uh, either way. Uh, it took a lot of determination to keep going. Uh, and then, of course, we'll look at him going back to uh, encourage the churches. The couple of things that at least I want to uh, set up for all of this, the, the message title, What Kept Paul Going? And certainly one is a, is a determination uh, in a sense of patience that I just don't think we, uh, we always uh, have uh, in our own evangelism. Uh, we share the gospel with somebody. We pray for him a couple of times. Uh, they don't come to the Lord, uh, but we need to be a, a little more determined, I think, uh, if we're going to lead people to the Lord. Sometimes we say that, that uh, we need patience in evangelism. Uh, I think that certainly uh, Paul had that, and I'm going to uh, maybe uh, illustrate. Yeah, it's an eating, uh, an eating illustration here uh, in a moment to maybe help us understand uh, what's gone wrong in at least our thinking culturally. Uh, but Paul certainly had an eternal perspective, and um, uh, he certainly believed that, uh, that uh, he would stand before Jesus Christ one day, give an account for his, uh, his life. Uh, and as we'll read from one of his uh, uh, passages, that uh, what we actually see in this world is very temporary, and we need to live for what is eternal or that which is unseen. Well, my uh, eating illustration is a fast food one. And uh, there's a lot of talk these days about, uh, about fast food and its uh, impact on our culture. Of course, uh, most of that uh, discussion is in regards to uh, it being unhealthy and how much uh, uh, weight we gain uh, and, and so forth. But there's another aspect that uh, one researcher at the University of Toronto came across. Uh, in this article, uh, he talks about the fact that it was uh, in, the 19, in 1960, McDonald's operated uh, 200 restaurants. By 2012, they had 31,000 restaurants. And uh, in 2012, uh, there's uh, about a quarter of a million fast food restaurants in America. And on any one given day, one in four Americans eats uh, at a fast food restaurant. Uh, The researcher's name is Sanford DeVoe. And uh, he thought there was uh, more to this than just people's eating habits. So he got uh, uh, a couple of groups to people, people together, uh, a control group, uh, and then one group that he was going to run a little experiment on. And what he did is he flashed corporate logos, not the food, just the corporate logos of McDonald's, KFC, Taco Bell, Burger King, Subway, uh, and Wendy's, uh, and just the logos uh, before their eyes. Uh, The other group, he didn't do anything. And then he gave both groups uh, an unrelated, had nothing to do with food, an unrelated task to do. The fast food group uh, tried to compete and did compete much faster uh, than, than the other group. In another experiment, uh, flashes of uh, fast food images uh, made students uh, uh, less able to sit still and enjoy music uh, than, uh, than another group. Uh, and a third experiment found people exposed to fast food logos showed a greater reluctance for savings. <laughs> so uh, it affects our, our psychology, apparently. He says in the article, based on these experiments, DeVoe has uh, concluded that fast food helps save us time Uh, But even just thinking about fast food restaurants make us live with more speed and less patience. DeVoe said, fast food culture doesn't just change the way we eat, but it also fundamentally alters 
the way we experience our time. It just makes us want to be in a hurry more, which is kind of interesting. And, uh, and that's a problem in terms of salvation, in terms of the gospel, in terms of sharing with other people, because it just flat out takes time. It takes time to listen to people. It takes time to understand where they're at. It takes time to kind of hear their questions so we can give uh, uh, proper answers. It takes time to us to, to be able to, to, to listen uh, and be able to respond in a way so that they don't have to decode what we're seeing because we're not laying it on with such Christian ease that they can't figure out what we're seeing. It just doesn't help a lot to ask somebody if they've been covered in the blood. You know, that, uh, they just don't really track along with that too well. We, we've got to uh, be able to, in a, in a winsome, in an accurate, in a truthful way, be able to share the gospel with others. And certainly the Apostle Paul is a great example for us uh, in that it wasn't Duracell batteries that kept Paul going. It was uh, an eternal perspective uh, and a resolve to stick to the mission. And that's what we see in the first seven verses. Again, we're in chapter 14. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and spoke that a great multitude, so that a great multitude of both the Jews and the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against their brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided. Part sided with the Jews, part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of uh, Lyconium, and to the surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there. So the first uh, point here about uh, P uh, Paul being resolved is this idea I've already mentioned to speak effectively. Uh, in verse 1, it says, uh, and so spoke that a great multitude. Uh, the NIV uh, kind of helps us on that. It says, uh, there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and, and Gentiles uh, believed. So both of these guys, of course, Paul does the focus here, knew their audience. They knew who, who they were, uh, were talking to. And uh, certainly one of the things that was uh, a focus of, uh, of, the, of the conference that I just came uh, from, which was uh, entitled uh, Forward Motion, is moving forward. We're thankful for the heritage we have as a movement, uh, all that Chuck meant to us, all that's been done in the past, uh, the fact that uh, Calvary Chapel was born out of a revival, the Jesus People revival and so forth. But we've got to keep moving forward. And the only way we can do that it actually is to reach the, the younger generation behind us. Uh, and there was lots of even some discussions in the afternoon uh, about how to do that appropriately and so forth. Uh, but one of the things that we need to see is that uh, we need to be able to learn our audience, whoever that might be, uh, those people that we're sharing with, uh, and be able to reach them at the level that they're at without, without compromising the truth of the gospel. Again, it's that challenge of being relative but biblical uh, at the same time. And uh, we're going to see that Paul was never willing to, uh, to compromise one for the other, uh, but was able to share the gospel very effectively, whether he was with an audience he'd be familiar with, Jews in a synagogue, or, or Gentiles uh, out on the, uh, in the marketplace. Uh, secondly, Paul resolved to, to, to never give up. Uh, verse 3, therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, uh, who was very witness to, his, uh, to the word of grace. The therefore is important. It refers back to what has previously, just immediately, previously been said. So they didn't stay there a long time because many people were getting saved. They stayed there a long time because there were problems, because there was difficulty. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's important to know. Uh, sometimes if we have <laughs> problems or difficulty, uh, and sharing the gospel in a particular place with a particular group of people or persons, our tendency is to move right on. <laughs> and uh, Paul says, we're having some problems here, so uh, we're going to stay around for a while uh, because we need to do that, and we need to help these believers that are here uh, in this task as well. Uh, the harder it got, the more determined uh, they got. I don't know if you're like that in any of your... Uh, DIY projects, I know I can kind of be like that, that uh, something's not quite working out. 
I'm going to put this sink in. I don't care how many tools I have to buy, and I don't care if I have to buy another sink, but this is going, you know, it's like <laughs> when things are, and he's laughing because he's a mechanic. This is, this is the mechanic's life here, you know, it's like uh, when the nut strips off, we are not giving up, you know, it's just, you, you kind of have to have this determination sometimes uh, to get some, uh, some projects done around the house, but it's true of the gospel uh, as, as well. Uh, this is what Paul says in writing to the church in Corinth, first letter, chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined to not, to not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, uh, in much trembling. Uh, and just to say that uh, uh, that verse, verse 3, is not exactly the image of the Apostle Paul in, in, in preaching the gospel. So if the Apostle Paul could keep going forward in weakness, in fear, in much trembling, I think we can kind of relate to that verse uh, much in sharing the gospel. Uh, certainly we should be able to as well. He says, And my speech and my preaching were not worth uh, persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I think Paul's just simply saying that um, he didn't come there in, with his uh, intellectual ability, which he, which he certainly had, uh, simply talk people in to becoming Christians. Uh, he just simply shared the truth of the gospel. Uh, he, I'm sure he was, uh, uh, met them right where they were at, uh, and it was with the Spirit of God that led people to faith uh, in Jesus Christ and that's absolutely true for us. I mean, all we, all we can do is what we can do. All we can do is share the gospel. All we can do is tell them about the Lord. Uh, and we certainly need, need to do that because uh, uh, due to the, uh, the media and the culture, basically, a lot of people know is God is the bully on the block. You know, God is the one, uh, the bully saying, you can't do that, you can't, and that's wrong. You know, and, and that's not God. Uh, God is a God of love. Certainly he's a God of righteousness and justice and so forth, but he's a God of love and grace and mercy. And that's a message that will only get out if Hollywood gets it together. No, see, it's not going to happen that way. If our government officials and the right politics, no, see, that's, it's, not gonna, it's only going to be as we share it, uh, just person to person. Uh, the first century church didn't have a lot going for them out there either in terms of the culture, in terms of government. I don't know what they had, well, I, knew, I know what they had going in terms of media. It was a thing called a play. And, uh, uh, and they were uh, great influences over their culture. But Christianity still spread like wildfire in the first century. And Paul says, it wasn't with my persuasive words. It was with a demonstration of the spirit uh, in of power. So we need to be effective, as effective as we can. Uh, and we need to be determined to not give up. And certainly we, uh, we can see that in the Apostle Paul. Secondly, the response to Paul and the gospel, and it's going to be quite diverse, we see in verse 8 to 20. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting a cripple from his mother's womb. He would never walk. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up on your feet, uh, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the, the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priests of Zeus, whose temple was in front of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, <coughs> crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways, nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. 
And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. So uh, uh, again, I said there was a diversity of responses. Uh, and certainly that, that is true here. Uh, the crippled man responded in, uh, in faith. Last half of verse 9, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had the faith to be, uh, to be healed. Uh, one of the things important to note is that this man had been listening to the Apostle Paul. I don't think he was listening to him discuss the weather. Uh, I think he was listening to him discuss uh, God, the nature of God, the nature of man, salvation, uh, coming to understand uh, who God was and so forth. Uh, and, then, and then we see Paul uh, see in him that he had the faith to be healed. It doesn't really say how he did that. Uh, I don't think he texted him. Uh, I got the faith to be healed over here. Check me out. Uh, but uh, uh, somehow Paul understood that through the spirit that this guy uh, had the faith to be healed, simply speaks and tells him to just stand up. And the guy gets up and walks. And it's a tremendous miracle because the guy's been crippled since birth. Uh, it was obvious to uh, everybody something supernatural had just uh, taken place. So it's in this case, not the faith of Paul, but the faith of, of the person. Uh, Mike Stengel and I were uh, in India on one of our trips and outside of Madras and doing an outreach with a little, a little local church uh, there. And um, the church that was sponsoring us had a, a woman who was a Sunday school teacher. She was a teacher by training as well and been part of the church for many years. And she was crippled. She was in a wheelchair uh, as a result of a car accident. Uh, and um, she basically came, came uh, ahead of the meeting uh, and told us that she believed that God was going to heal her that night. And God healed her that night after we, uh, you know, preached and shared testimony and did an altar call. A lot of people came forward, and then we'd always do, uh, basically pray, and, and they would line up, sometimes like a, like a block long, uh, to wait to get prayer. There's not a lot of other options uh, for them. Uh, and she got in the line with everybody else, and, uh, yeah, we prayed for her, and she stood right up, and she was... Uh, she was healed. Uh, it's, it's just interesting, you know, how God can communicate that to a heart of a person that maybe has uh, been like this man crippled since birth, that this is the day that uh, you're going to be healed if you just respond in, uh, in faith. Uh, Paul somehow uh, looks intently at that, and uh, this guy is, again, responding to what Paul is saying. Again, sometimes we say faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's talking about salvation. Uh, but uh, uh, in this bigger picture of things here, just hearing about God and that God is a loving God and God has the power to heal and God cares, it was enough for, uh, for this person to uh, respond. Which brings the second response, which is one of idolatry. Uh, again, they're very superstitious. So they think that Barnabas is, uh, is Jupiter or Zeus and Paul is Mercury or Hermes. Uh, Hermes is the patron god of that particular town. So it's a great opportunity for the priest uh, to jump out, try to take advantage of the situation. Hey, supernatural event has gone on here. Pretty sure that was my God that did that. So let's uh, bring out an oxen and uh, uh, sacrifice to these gods uh, right, uh, right here. And it had to be a great temptation, or at least it could have been a great temptation to Paul and Barnabas to see that as an opportunity and a platform uh, for sharing, sharing the gospel. They're out there as missionaries. They're in a town they've never been there before. They have no idea how people are going to respond to the gospel. You get a guy coming out saying, you guys are gods. Uh, we want to worship you, uh, and we're all going to bow down to you. That would be quite the platform then to take advantage of that and say, we're glad that you noticed that. Yes, we are. You know? uh, but here's what also, also we want you to know. There's a God greater than us. His name is J. Well, missionaries have actually done this. Uh, it was actually the MO or the instruction to early Catholic mission, uh, missionaries that went out. They were instructed and told, according to church history, uh, and you can evidence this if you travel the world, that wherever you go culturally, try to find something in that culture, not just of a redemptive nature, uh, but you can adapt the gospel itself to help fit into the culture of the people you're trying to reach. And that's why Roman Catholicism is very different from one part of the country uh, to another. And it's very different in South America 
than it is in North America. It's very different in Asia uh, than it is uh, uh, Northern Europe. It's very different in Southern Europe. It's very different uh, in, the, in the Middle East. It's a constant adaptation. Uh, but Paul and Barnabas would not do it. Uh, they would not say that the end justifies the means. The ends, uh, we would have this platform and maybe a lot of people, maybe thousands would come to faith in Jesus Christ, but it would be built on this platform of falsehood, assuming that their religion is valid and this is just in addition to it. We call it syncretism, uh, where you blend. It was the guilt of the Old Testament. When we read about in the Old Testament, the idolatry that took place there in, uh, in Israel, uh, we forget the fact that the people were still going to the <laughs> temple, they were still worshiping God, uh, and they were still doing the sacrifices and obeying uh, the Sabbath laws and the laws of Moses. They were just also worshiping all of these other gods, blending the two together. Today, we call it the New Age Movement. <laughs> it's, a, it's a smorgasbord, smorgasbord of religion. Just walk down the line, pick whatever you want. You know, when you go to, you go to a buffet, you, when you go down to the buffet, do you usually go through and go, I'm going to pick all the things I don't like to eat and skip all the things that I do. No, you usually kind of pick what you want. Uh, and we live in that day. People pick what they want. They even pick parts of Christianity, parts of Judaism, parts of Hinduism, parts, and they just kind of blend them together. Uh, and um, uh, and was, some would say, well, as long as they've got Jesus, that's the main thing. Which Jesus would that be exactly, though? Would it be the second person of the Trinity who died and rose again, who bodily rose again, that his shed blood is the only thing that can give us righteousness and cleanse us from our sin? Well, you're being pretty narrow now. So we're, but we've got Paul and Barnabas. What a great example. We should be thankful that these guys did not compromise the truth of the gospel at this juncture simply to reach more people, uh, but they refused to, to do it. The crowd responded in idolatry, uh, uh, in the terms of uh, superstition, but um, they would not uh, compromise the truth, and neither should we. Uh, thirdly, the crowd responded, well, with stones, verse 19. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. So from these previous towns where Paul has been, kind of stirred up the agitators there, we better follow this guy, see where, uh, where, he's, where he's going. Uh, and they come and persuade, quote, the multitude, uh, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him uh, to, uh, to be dead. So again, the, uh, this, uh, these are Jewish leaders who have rejected the, the gospel. They're able to persuade uh, others uh, because the message of the cross is offensive uh, and it is idolatrous uh, to Jewish people in the first century and many today. Uh, it's the belief that God Almighty came and inhabited human flesh. Uh, and it's just hard for them to get their minds around it. Uh, it's predicted in the scriptures. We can give uh, uh, all the text and so forth for it and reasons for faith for somebody that knows those scriptures. Uh, but uh, it still requires a work of the spirit, an open heart. Uh, and these men uh, had neither of those things. Now we can kind of, by the time we hit chapter, in the chapter 14 and we get these guys back in Antioch, we can peg the date that is 49 AD. <laughs> that becomes of interest because in about 49, 49 A.D., Paul writes to the church back in Galatia, and he writes uh, of this letter. So uh, very early epistle. Uh, in, in it, in chapter 6, verse 12, uh, he says the following. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, uh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Now, this, this is a, a, a thing of Judaism, of course. And he's saying, there are some that are saying, go ahead and be circumcised, then you won't offend the Jews, and then you won't suffer persecution. Deny that you're saved by grace and by grace alone, so that you don't have to suffer persecution. If you, you could do that, you could deny the truth, you could compromise, and you could avoid a lot of headache and a lot of trouble in your lives. Obviously, Paul's saying uh, not, not to do that. It's the whole issue with the uh, this little church early on in the first century living in southern Judah uh, they're, they're, they're all Jewish uh, the writer, uh, I think it's Paul is writing to them, the, his, the epistle to the Hebrews, and their whole issue is that uh, they're going through persecution 
And the writer says early that uh, you know some of you have been in prison. Some of you have had your property taken away. Nobody's resisted yet to the point of shedding blood. Nobody's been martyred yet, but it's coming, uh, and it's coming soon. And their, their, their message, and here's what we need to know, the reason he's writing the letter is, can we just kind of get unsaved <laughs> and go back into Judaism for a time and then get resaved later after the persecution is over? And of course, the answer to that is no. Once you're saved, you're saved. You can't get unsaved and then get resaved again. That's really the theme of the, uh, that particular uh, letter. Uh, but uh, this is all about uh, Paul not compromising the truth of the gospel for the sake of the people he's trying to reach. Uh, again, he spoke effectively. He knew the culture. He understood the culture. He could relate to the people. He could say things in a way that they would understand, but he never compromised the truth, and certainly that's the great balance here, uh, and for us as well. <coughs> uh, John Stott, in, uh, in one, of, one of his books, and uh, I actually had the opportunity to have a conversation with him uh, one time about it when he was guest speaking here in the islands a number of years ago. He's, uh, he's with the Lord now. Uh, but uh, uh, he, he would talk about the fact that uh, we need to be great observers of, of the culture. But he says we need to observe it in a way that we do not become absorbed by it. Uh, observe it without, without drinking the Kool-Aid <laughs> and being part of it. Now, Pastor Chuck would, would say the same thing in, in the way of an illustration. Uh, Chuck would say uh, uh, you would uh, illustrate it as a boat. A boat on the water can be uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, it can uh, be very useful. It can transportate, transfer, uh, transportate goods and services. Uh, it can be used recreational and so for many uses for the boat on the water. But if the water gets inside the boat, then it's no good to anybody. And that's why Paul says... Uh, uh, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed from it by the renewing of your mind. Uh, and, of course, the J.B. Phillips translation is, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Uh, it'll try to do that with our lives and our integrity and our character, but with the message of the gospel as well. And so we need to be careful. Paul was very careful uh, about it uh, as well. So there's uh, difference, uh, differences and a great diversity in terms of a response to Paul in the gospel. But one of the responses is very interesting. Uh, that's really not uh, here in the text. We just have to read a little to know uh, another aspect of it that's going on. There's a young teenager who did respond uh, with courage his name is Timothy, and this is his city, the city of, uh, of Lystra. Uh, and I would just ask you, do you think this, this uh, impacted his life much at all? To hear the Apostle Paul preach the gospel. Uh, I'll make a little case here in a moment uh, that uh, he received the gospel on this first trip. Uh, and then he sees the Apostle, his, his father in the faith, in a sense, dragged outside the town, stoned and left for dead. Uh, and then he sees them get back up, uh, bruised and bloody, and march right back into the same town in order to continue to minister to the saints before he moves on to the, uh, to the next city. Well, Paul writing to Timothy near the end of his life in 2 Timothy 3.10 uh, says the following, But you have carefully followed my doctrine. This is what he's saying to Timothy. You followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. That's our story here. What part uh, persecutions I endured, and out, of all of, uh, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer uh, persecution. Now again, we know that Timothy is already a believer when Paul returns to the city the second time and then goes with him, becomes part of his, uh, his ministry team. We also know that Paul refers to him as a son in the faith. Therefore, it's Paul that led him to the Lord. So therefore, this means that it's on this occasion, uh, during this time period, this first uh, visit to the city, that Timothy comes to faith uh, in Christ. Now, we would say, therefore... Paul leaned outside the city, beat to a pulp, bleeding in a gutter somewhere, 
Is that a picture of a successful evangelistic campaign? In other words, we invite Greg Laurie over. We're going to have to stay at Aloha Stadium. We get, you know, however many thousand of people out there. But, man, right after the guy preaches, a bunch of crowd gra grabs Greg. They drag him outside, and they stone him and beat him to death. Would we consider that a successful evangelistic campaign? Apparently, to the Apostle Paul, it was. And he said, and the Lord delivered me every time. That's a tough deliverance. But he'd go, hey, I didn't die. <laughs> I got back up, didn't I? Uh, it's just a different perspective on evangelism, uh, on, on ensuring the gospel. I don't know how many people got saved, but a young teenager named Timothy uh, got saved. And, uh, and I think Paul obviously considers this uh, a successful evangelistic campaign. Why? Because he presented the truth of the gospel without compromise. And, and that's, that's what it is. Uh, he certainly he said, said, Timothy, you know my manner of life. So it wasn't just his words that were the truth, but he backed it up with his lifestyle. Whatever the results were, there are a lot of different results along the road here with Paul. Uh, but Paul, as far as Paul's concerned, it's all good because he was doing all that he could do on his end of the deal, which was to share the truth, out compromise, and live it out before the people uh, that were coming to faith uh, in Christ. Uh, lastly, the response of Paul to the persecution really is what we're talking about already. Again, the diversity in Antioch, Paul was allowed to escape. And Iconium got overruled the circumstances, uh, and Paul got a warning that it was about ready to happen and got out of town. Uh, in Lystra, he did not escape. Uh, and again, the question is, did God take care of him in Lystra? Uh, and I think as far as the apostle Paul is concerned, uh, he would say that, uh, that he did. Sometimes it's under those kind of circumstances where we're being stoned, going through a fiery furnace, uh, that God does bring a deliverance, not maybe in the hour we want, in the way we want, in the shape we want, uh, that we become the most effective in terms of sharing uh, the message and the good news of Christ with others. Uh, Paul would uh, write this later. We've made reference to this uh, list of experiences of his here in 2 Corinthians 11.23. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Uh, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. So the, the one stoning is our incident here uh, in Lystra, the home of uh, Timothy. But God's plan for his life wouldn't be frustrated. And uh, again, verse 19, supposing him to be dead, uh, dead or not, it's a miracle that this guy gets up and keeps uh, going. Again, how does he do it? That's uh, our, our message title, What Kept Paul Going? Uh, and again, it was just a determination with the mission God gave him and this eternal perspective. Listen to what he says again in 2 Corinthians 4.16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though outward, our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, that's what Paul considered his cracks, all the stuff that's happening to him. Uh, he considered it a light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. Uh, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Uh, it's hard to live in this world without looking at the things that are seen. So I've got to get up every day and go to work and take care of life and so forth. Uh, but we can become so focused on these things that are all going to perish in time, uh, we forget about all eternity. And the Apostle Paul was able to somehow through it all keep his eyes fixed uh, on, on the prize, uh, which is heaven, and to be with the Lord for all eternity. Paul would say, we fix our eyes, which means to focus like with a telescope uh, on Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm going to read uh, kind of a, a longer quote here from Alan Redpath, one of my favorite uh, uh, writers. Alan's uh, been with the Lord for some time towards the end of his life, kind of uh, became uh, in, affiliated with Calvaries and stuff. I uh, used to speak at some of the conferences a number of years ago. I think we still carry some of his books, but always uh, very insightful. Uh, and, uh, and he writes, now Paul says, because I have looked and understood, because I have taken the time not to glance casually at spiritual things, but sat down and thought them through 
and examined them with my mind and my heart until they came into clear focus. Something tremendous has happened in my life because I look so intensely. That, uh, that look brought conviction, very important word, conviction. I have looked long into the face of my Lord, says Paul in effect. I have looked beyond this earthly life. Uh, as I have gazed, I have thought about heaven, and because of this, I have a faith uh, like they had in the Old Testament times. As they believe, so I believe, and therefore I speak. I have been gripped by the same spirit of faith because this has become a conviction that God uh, who raised Jesus from the dead is going to raise me also together with you. And one day we're going to meet again in heaven and stand beside each other as we have ministered to each other here on earth. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the things done in our bodies because I believe this, I can never be the same man uh, again. And, and Alan Prath wasn't. I, I actually knew a guy that was from the same town in Scotland that he was from. And he talked about uh, he was a very well-known pastor and minister in his little community. And he basically got very sick and almost died. Uh, and then when he recovered from that, he was never the same man again. I don't know if it was uh, uh, that experience that changed him. But somewhere in there, he deepened his relationship and his commitment to God. Uh, and it uh, changed and altered his life and altered his ministry. And he's saying that... He sees this in the Apostle Paul. That at some point in time, he believes Paul has gotten on, on his knees before the Lord and, and like looking in a telescope and trying to get it really focused in, he's seen the Lord in the face of the Lord and he says he's never the same again. He's so convinced that one day we're all going to stand there before God together that uh, that's what he's got his life focused on now. Uh, and it's changed him. Alan says it's changed him. He believes that it's at the heart of what Paul uh, keeps Paul going. The resolve of Paul to his mission, response to the gospel, uh, and thirdly, uh, Paul returned to the churches, uh, but with a purpose. And we'll see as we'll read, uh, without looking at the map again, Paul could have crossed the, the Tarsus Mountains and, and gone right back over into uh, southern Lebanon and back to the church in Antioch. But he, we would say he took the long way home in order to get back to these churches, but these churches where he had been persecuted. Verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, <laughs> we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through uh, Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to uh, Atalia. Uh, from there they sailed to Antioch when they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported <coughs> all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time uh, with the disciples. So. Uh, important ministry on the return trip. We first note that they uh, continue to, uh, to preach the gospel, going back to these same cities, again, to organize the church, to uh, strengthen the church, to minister to the church, but sharing the gospel uh, along the way. Uh, because uh, you just never know when God's going to give you the opportunity and bring those people uh, into your lives uh, that are open to, to the gospel it, uh, itself. Uh, when we were flying uh, to California on this last last trip, we uh, Kathy and I got on, and you're kind of you know making your way, trying to figure out what row you are, and it's like you're <laughs> getting further and further in the back of the plane. We're pretty much in the back of the plane. I'm just glad I wasn't in that back row. I love those seats, you know, where you you go like that in it. It doesn't go back. I hate that seat, but uh, so fortunately we're a couple rows before that. But we're with a group of tourists from China. <laughs> None of them speak any English. And uh, so it's uh, me and then Kathy and this young, young guy, probably 21, 22 years old. You can tell they're pretty excited, you know, the, you know, they're on vacation and stuff and going to the United States and going to California. And uh, so we're trying to talk to him a little bit. And it just becomes obvious, just, okay, nothing. Uh, he, he doesn't know a yes or a no. And uh, <coughs> I know more Mandarin than he knows English. Five words, but uh, I can say that I, because he didn't have any. But uh, then it, it occurred to me as we were sitting there that uh, uh, in my uh, carry-on, uh, in the, uh, the luggage compartment above, 
uh, are some tracks left over from our last trip where we went to China. So I, I reached up and actually was able to get a, give, get a track and give him a track written uh, in Chinese. And it is, I just give it to him and it's like, you'd see his eyes like lit up, like he couldn't believe I would have anything written in Chinese, which is, might have been the only guy on the plane that had one of those. I don't know, I didn't survey anyone, but just saying. But uh, it was great, he just lit up, he read the whole thing and he's like, oh, he's all smiles and stuff. And, and uh, there was no way to like, <laughs> follow up, say a thing, but everything was in, in the track and everything. And uh, you love it when the Lord, uh, I'm kind of thick headed. I need it to be slightly obvious sometimes, you know, when those uh, occurrences uh, come, but you just never know. On the, on the way back, then uh, same thing, you know, we're sitting, there's always going to be somebody uh, by the window if, if it's, uh, you know, the particular plane uh, that we're on. And uh, there was a young gal who's an uh, army officer stationed at uh, Schofield and so uh, Kathy uh, starts talking to her and then, well, you, you know, you got a few hours, so she gets to hear our whole life story, uh, testimonies and the gospel and, uh, uh, you know, all, all that stuff. And uh, yeah, if you're not sure what a divine appointment uh, looks like, just hang out with my wife. She's a living divine appointment. There's not, uh, there's not too many uh, gals that wouldn't want to just sit and talk with her for several hours. So it's just kind of very, you know, it, it, it's, there's no setting out. I hope I can preach the gospel today. It's just kind of a natural occurrence. We call it bearing fruit. It's just a natural occurrence. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, we experience that. And, and the Apostle Paul, he continues preaching and sharing the gospel uh, on his return. Secondly, uh, he does it for the purpose to strengthen and encourage uh, the church. He told them to continue uh, in, uh, in the faith. And uh, it had to be a, uh, an exciting time for these believers, but... Uh, uh, you know, a difficult time as well. I mean, they understand the, the basis uh, of the gospel and being saved by grace. Uh, again, some of them were Jewish, so they would know the Old Testament scriptures. And they're trying, with Paul's help, very quickly to sort through seeing Jesus uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and then Paul has to very quickly, uh, maybe in a period of days, uh, try to figure out which of these guys are going to be the, uh, uh, the leaders of this, of this church. And so he's appointing uh, leaders. Uh, but keep in mind the fact that, uh, that uh, there may not have been a real rush, rush to be involved in, uh, in leadership as Paul is standing before them with all of the scars and all of the bruises uh, and everything for having been uh, stoned uh, in Lystra. Uh, there may not have been a lot of people saying, man, I hope that happens to me. Let psych me up right now. You know, so I mean, the, the people that probably said, hey, uh, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm willing. You know, they might have been few and far, far between. They were probably pretty committed. Uh, uh, you're probably pretty committed if you're going to be a leader in a church uh, in China today, in a Muslim country today, in Cuba today, uh, as it was in the first century for the Apostle Paul. But he returns to strengthen and encourage them. Uh, he returns to organize uh, the churches, to uh, uh, appoint elders. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when it's uh, uh, a little more difficult, uh, trying to figure out leadership becomes uh, a little easier sometimes. One of the speakers at the uh, conference where I was, Don McClure, <coughs> and Don, um, we, we've actually had him, brought him over and spoken at the church, uh, did a men's conference for us a number of years ago. It's one of those original associate pastors with Chuck when he first started out, went up to uh, Twin Peaks area, Southern California, started a church, started the first uh, Calvary Chapel Bible College up there, uh, turned that over to someone else and then went down to Redlands, uh, started a church there near uh, uh, the university there. Uh, and could have been quite comfortable there with uh, um, a very healthy church, but um, was praying that God might uh, have something different, something new for him. And uh, about that time, he got a call from Pastor Chuck and said, hey, would you like to go up and take over a, a church up in San Jose, California? They have a huge facility. They've uh, way overbuilt, and they kept borrowing. It was kind of like their philosophy was build it, and they will come. Uh, I think that works in a movie for the Field of Dreams, but uh, uh, not in real church life. Uh, but they kept building and building and building, and then building across the freeway to the other side and building. And they were millions of dollars in debt. Uh, and if somebody didn't come in and rescue them financially, there might have been people going to jail. Uh, it was a denominational church, and they were reaching out to Chuck to see, can you kind of help us out here uh, with a pastor and finances and so forth? So. 
uh, Don prayed about it and moved up there with his, uh, with his family, uh, but the church has no money and there are millions of dollars in debt. So basically he moved into the church with his, uh, with his family because they had some dorms that were built in there. And he took uh, a dollar a year uh, as his salary uh, and then notified to the rest of the folks that were on the staff at the church. He didn't fire anyone or anything. He, he retained everybody and just said, uh, you know, there's no more salaries though. You know, I'll give you a dollar a year so you can say you got a salary from the church and uh, there's plenty of room in this place. This place is huge. Just move your family in and uh, we'll see what the Lord got, uh, has for us. And it was just, he said it was amazing how many of them were no longer called to the ministry. It was just, it was just amazing. You know, the worship leader, for example, had been there for over 10 years, called of God. But a dollar a year, he wasn't called of God anymore. You know, it was just amazing how it all separated when things got uh, a little more difficult. So when we read about Paul, uh, again, appointing elders, uh, we kind of have to admire these men under these circumstances uh, with with a, basically a, maybe a two-week discipleship course from the Apostle Paul. That's all they got going, uh, and tremendous persecution possibly uh, facing ahead of them, but they're willing to accept whatever responsibility they could uh, for uh, the church and for the believers uh, around them. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan, again, another one of my uh, British friends that I, uh, uh, that I read this week, uh, says, uh, says the following. The lure of the lonely saints compelled him to turn his back upon the Tarsus passes and the quick way home to tramp the long distances that he might minister a new courage to them. And what courage he must have brought when he came and stood in the midst of that little group at Lystra and they saw the brands of the Lord Jesus upon his face, the brutal bruising of the stone still there. I think the fellowship of the saints drew him the long way home again. And, uh, the, uh, and that will happen to you when you uh, invest yourself into other people. They have a, a way of drawing themselves to you. Uh, and it was true of, of the Apostle Paul. This man with this tremendous uh, intellect, uh, you know, this great rabbinical thinker and teacher, uh, but uh, a great heart of not just a missionary, but a pastor. Uh, and then lastly, returns home, uh, back to the home church. As I mentioned, uh, the trip had taken a year they traveled on foot uh, and by boat about 1,100 miles. Uh, we could say then the first ever missionary conference was held uh, as they report back to the church all that the Lord had, uh, had done. Again, what keeps Paul going? An eternal perspective. Uh, and uh, he knew that it wouldn't be easy going into it. And we need to know that as well. Uh, uh, and certainly we live in a, a day where we can read almost daily if you're reading some of the news sources that, that I read about uh, discrimination against Christians and different things that are said and done against uh, ho a high profile people that, uh, uh, that know the Lord, uh, we just need to know it's not going to be easy and, and just accept that. Uh, I read an article yesterday about uh, uh, the supplier of uh, football helmets to the National Football League, Shoot Sports. Uh, there's a lot of concern about trying to make the helmets better because of the concern about concussions, if you're not up with uh, or could care less about football, that's, uh, that's a big concern these days. Uh, and uh, even the uh, military has been working with uh, the, uh, the same group of people to try to figure out uh, uh, better helmets for the military, trying to share technology and so forth, because uh, concussion is a, is a big problem. Uh, but they put a warning uh, uh, there on, on their website uh, that reads the following, warning. No helmet system can prevent concussion or eliminate the risk of serious head or neck injuries while playing football. So we're doing our best, but uh, may not help you. Uh, and then the, the warning goes on uh, that says, uh, quote, to avoid these risks of playing football, do not engage in the sport of football. <laughs> Here's a football helmet. It's the best we can do. You'll probably get hurt doing this. So don't sue us later, in, uh, in <laughs> other words. And uh, I kind of reworded this. Uh, we could have a warning uh, over our lives that says, to avoid the risk of discipleship, do not engage in following Jesus or sharing the gospel with others. Maybe we should just put that, put it right on the front of the Bible. Hey, welcome to the family of God and have that right on the front. This is not going to be easy. 
You know, Jesus preaches a whole sermon about it in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, blessed are you when people persecute you. What, what, what does that mean, persecute? What does it mean? <laughs> you know, uh, it's, we sometimes call it the fine print of discipleship. You know, if we just know it going in, uh, it might make it a little easier uh, going through the process. We can anticipate different responses to the gospel. But, you know, there's people out there like the guy with uh, uh, crippled feet. Man, they're just like waiting for someone to say the word. Uh, th- those people are out there. Uh, but there's also people that are going to be very antagonistic as well, especially in the culture we live in t- uh, today. But we still need to make sure we're doing our very best to stay on mission, to stay on track, to communicate the gospel in a way that it's culturally relative to where people are at, uh, but without compromising, without compromising the truth. There's a lot of that going around. So uh, it's good for us to study this, to look at the Apostle Paul, to see his commitment level, but the commitment level to the truth uh, of the gospel.
earth can shake The sky come down The mountains all fall to the ground But I will fear none of these things Shout of me, Lord, underneath your wings Dark waters rise and thunders bow The wheels of war are going Shelter.